welcome to Moving the Needle on Wicked Problems, our podcast. Today, our podcast is all about Ukraine. If ever there was a wicked problem, it is the situation in Ukraine. Perhaps the term wicked is too mild for what the Ukrainians are facing, an unprovoked and brutal war at the hands of Vladimir Putin in Russia. The Ukrainian people have faced immense destruction, bombardment by missiles that have destroyed their homes and inflicted heavy losses. They are being killed on a daily basis as the senseless war continues. But they have shown remarkable courage and valor as they have come together to defend their country against a brutal invader. Absolutely, Senator. Uh, Ukrainians have held strong and allies such as Canada have continued to support Ukraine with humanitarian assistance, military aid, and also open their doors to refugees that have fled the conflict. War is continuing. Ukraine desperately needs more support. Our guest today will help provide a view of what's happening on the ground and what Ukraine needs to push back this brutal invader. Let's get to the interview. delve into this, we are speaking with Kyra Rudek. Kyra is a member of the Ukrainian parliament, leader of the political party Golos, and vice president of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. She is calling us in from Kiev and is on a diesel generator because power in Kiev goes in and out because of the situation. Welcome, Kyra, and thank you so much for joining us today. Senator Omidvar, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for having me and um, giving me an opportunity to tell the story. So let's start with a question that I think everyone would want an answer to. What is your life like in Ukraine? What does it mean to live in a war zone and continue your life? Uh, I can tell you about my day to day. Mm -hmm. uh, we woke up um, because of the air raid siren was on. We take it very seriously because we know that um, Russia intensifies their attacks closer to the year anniversary of the full scale invasion. We went to under the stairs where we hide its improvised bomb shelter at my home. Uh, where we had a serial and uh, where we were sitting for three and a half hours until the air raid sirens went off. Uh, after that, I went out and checked. Uh, we did not have electricity and did not have running water. However, we have heat, which is a great thing. And uh, so uh, I was, um, um, I turned on the diesel generator and uh, we were getting ready with our stuff. Uh, and most of all, I was waiting until the real electricity will appear. So generally, I will tell you some hints. So you have all your um, lights on all the time, especially at night when the electricity is off, because um, most of the times energy appears 3 to 5 a.m. And this is your time to quickly get up and do everything around the house. This is the time when you have to run dishwasher, washing machine, dryer and everything because you may not have this ability. And then you go to sleep and it's, of course it's, um, uh, it's devastating and creates lot of, lots of issues. But all in all, we, we are having heat, so it's, it's a good thing. And of course, it's a good thing that seems that today's missile attack did not kill anybody. The issue that we are having living in the peaceful cities is that you never know um, what's going to happen tomorrow. So then uh, continuing with my day, uh, I went out for a quick grocery shopping. They, uh, uh, we do not have uh, our traffic lights working, so you have to be really, 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 really careful driving around. And the curfew is still on and the streets are not being highlighted at night. So the best way for a conscious driver as myself is to do everything you have to do uh, during the light time. Uh, and then I came back, I did uh, some work and then there was another air raid siren. And then I was doing some, um, some TV interviews 
explaining to people why do we need why do we need weapons and support why do we need it so critically and why do we need it right now you know what i learned from my work is the time goes differently when you are sitting under the stairs hoping uh, that nobody will be killed today and when you are working internationally in high offices where it seems that you still have a luxury to wait another day so i want to tell everybody who is hearing right now no there is no time we are asking for for fighter jets for missiles for sophisticated weapons not because we like it or because we want it but because it's a matter of life and death for us it's a matter of are we going to have tomorrow uh, what's it going to look like for our children? What is going to look for our country and how many of us will live to, to see the victory that we all are absolutely sure will happen. On a larger scale, we are right now getting closer to a one year anniversary of the full scale invasion. And, um, of course, we know that uh, Putin and his uh, tyranny, they are fixated on the dates. So they are trying to get more and more forces in to, uh, to have some battlefield vic victory uh, closer to February 21st. They did not have any battlefield victory since September. So since uh, we took Kherson back. And this is why we know that they will be throwing people as battlefield meat just to to, to prove that they can do anything. Meanwhile, they continue the terrorist attacks on our cities and energy infrastructure. The issue that I'm ex the issues that I'm explaining to you with with like my particular home uh, is uh, they happen because right now more than fifty percent of our energy infrastructure is being destroyed, and every air raid attack is destroying more and more of that. So you can imagine that we are still super concentrated to get our critical infrastructure and hospitals have uh, have the electricity and have the power and the support. But for for people in the cities, it's just like if you're lucky, you get it. You get it half of the day. Uh, if you're not lucky, you get it at night. Uh, and you can imagine how hard it gets, especially in winter. I can tell you recently, my friend, she has a toddler. She called me and she was crying and I asked what happened. And she said, we live at 13th floor and we just got up by stairs. And I realized that I forgot my keys in the car. Mm. You imagine that these are the things that are happening every single day and they're getting harder and harder. And, uh, and we, on the other hand, we are almost gone through the, the winter and this is also like a good good thing because uh, we did not know if we will be lucky to do it on uh, a larger scale again what bothers me uh, a lot is our land our territory our our country that used to be a bread basket for the whole europe 20 percent of our land is minefield right now and because the war started in 2014, we know that it's incredibly hard and expensive to uh, to demine. And I don't know how much that will take. It will be probably decades before we will get all this land like cleaned up and people will be able to go outside normally. And it's another huge issue that we are having aside of the, uh, the fights, aside of the air raid sirens, aside of the um aside of the hurdles that we are having with energy uh and uh, like overall well-being what we uh, are also concerned of are the war war crimes and the uh, and and everything that's happening to the people the occupied territories you know i've been to bucha and irpin on the first day of liberation and it was the best and the worst decision that i have made in my life the best was because I know that we probably will get to the tribunal and that we will make sure that Putin and his generals and everybody related will pay for their crimes. I know that at this moment, Russians will say that it did not happen. It was all set up and that it was just like all like, like, like they're saying right now. And I know that I will be able to say that I have witnessed it in my, with my own eyes. The worst is because things that you 
that I have seen, like, you cannot forget them, but it's probably something something that we have to have in ourselves so that we will n never never go back and never repeat the mistakes that are being made. And we will make sure that our lives, all the people who are saying, oh, it may, it may be possible to agree with Russia or it may be possible to have some peace that that we will tell them no, and we will know exactly why we are saying that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Kyra, for uh, putting, uh, you know, your daily life into the context of what is happening more broadly in Ukraine and the consequences for the people of Ukraine. They are really stunning. Um, but you also talked at a very human level about t reaching out to friends, and friends reaching out to others. How are Ukrainians rallying around each other to deal with this brutal war and just the business of, of, of keeping alive and keeping warm and keeping fed? How are you doing that? I think like one of the, uh, one of the things that happened to our nation is that we are united as never before. So when uh, when the full scale invasion started, uh, and we at some point we learned that uh, Kiev may be surrounded, and uh, there was one entrance and exit from the city, it was the first time when you realize that you have to take care not only about yourself and your family, but about so many people around you, like physically care, make sure that they have uh, enough of food, water stored. Uh, and then the refugees started coming in and out, and then you you started like just making sure that everybody's, um, you know, one of my family members is calling it like birds on the tree uh, when it's cold. Like everybody sticking very close to each other. So mm -hmm. this is what we have to do as Ukrainians: stick very close to each other. Uh, so we um, we are doing this uh, those places of unbreakability, which is basically usually a heater, a charger, and a, a warm cup of tea. But it's something that people are setting up near their homes, in the stores, uh, everywhere to to help around. We are taking care and learning about people nearby, just to make sure that. Uh, everybody who needs help will uh, reach out to get it. On the local level, from the local government, uh, people are taking on so much responsibility because they finally learned that it's either all of us go through it with or nobody does. And um, and it became quite amazing so, so that we finally are learning how... You know, we are treating each other like just like as not as a as another human being, but like as another um, part of your huge fight. Like another two hands to hold a gun, another two hands to like run around with the, with the water for for the whole neighborhood. And you know that we all have to act as one. I have seen so much of people's bravery and open hearts during this time that sometimes I feel like I can explode like processing all of that. People evacuating animals from the front territories. People, uh, teachers uh, uh, being evacuated in the buses from occupied territories. They took forty. They took forty kids from from the occupied Mariupol and were able to get out of there. And and when they arrived to Kiev and they opened the door, you know what the first words that they say were: "No casualties." Huh. And it, and it was so amazing. So I can tell you, uh, the war brings out the worst and the best of you. And I think right now we are still at the point where there is lots of love and support left of people supporting each other. But this is not only happening inside the country. And this is also something that I want to share with you, that something that we have been completely blown off with was, was the amount of support we were getting from people from the countries that never knew that we existed. From people from different parts of the world who were sending warm food coming in to, to help feed our refugees, opening their homes for us, sending out money, support, pushing their governments. I think this feeling of unity, it did not uh, close in Ukraine. It went so far away and and it it made us remember 
how connected we are, how connected we are with our values, with our, uh, with our past, but also with the future that we all want to build and how important it is that we are sticking together. For that, I'm so grateful. Hmm. Now, what what is the sort of situation? Because uh, we we've, we've seen through the media, we've seen on various platforms, you know, intense fighting on the fronts right now. Uh, lots of casualties. Uh, uh, lots of people um, are are talking about, and you've even written about this that the next six months are essentially a, a critical stage in the war. Uh, what what is the situation on the front lines, and what does Ukraine need from its allies, like Canada, like the United States, like the European Union, to be able to push back uh, Russia and 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 eventually, hopefully, uh, liberate all of your lands? So, um, since September, Putin was gathering and mobilizing his forces. They have mobilized around five hundred thousand soldiers and have been training them. Also, they keep producing weapons and sometimes even buying the drones from, from Iran. So uh, his goal is to push forward and take more of our land and uh, kill, create more terror and kill more of our people. And these fighting started probably, the intense fighting started like a week ago. We did not know if it is the offense that we expected, but it seems that it is. It's safe to say that it is especially with the missile attacks that happened today. We, on our side, we cannot use people as battlefield meat. It's not our strategy, it's not our way. And this is why in this David versus Goliath fight, we have to be smarter, we have to be faster, we have to be more creative, and we have to be uh, better equipped. And this is why we have been constantly asking for, for more sophisticated weapons. To, to use it against the Russians, especially wide range missiles and missile systems. So we, we can push them further uh, out of the battlefield and we can reach out to their pr production of the weapons and the supplies uh, to, to be able to push them further. Um, the, the fighting are really heavy. And we, we know that there are many people losing their lives right now. And uh, uh, they are doing that because it's just in, incredibly hard to, to fight the, the enemy that is 10 times larger than you. Uh, so uh, what are the good things is that we received the confirmation there uh, that there would be more and more weapons coming in. So we are not facing Russians like empty handed, but the issue and the main issues when those weapons are coming. The unfortunate thing that we learned over the past year is that between somebody getting on a stage and saying yes for the weapons and the moment that Ukrainian soldier is holding these weapons in, in his or her hands, uh, it's, uh, it could be like six months. And it's like, you don't know if you're going to be there in six months. And this is why we are right now pushing very hard to, to speed up the process and the logistics and everything. Because, uh, because Putin was preparing like a while ago. Uh, we, what we need is to make sure that we can compensate to this huge difference between forces with the quality of the weapons and the amount of the weapons and the supplies. And this has not been news for our allies, but what we have seen over the last couple of months is that, you know, I want to hope that it was a turning point and a turning tide, especially when President Biden announced that we will get the Patriot systems. It was like a mentally switching point. And then when the uh, allies agreed to send us tanks, it was also a switching point. So now we hope that it will be helpful, especially when it when they all will arrive to to the battlefield. That it will be helpful and will allow us to uh, to fight back and allow us to defend ourselves. We know the goal in this war is to liberate our country and to restore the borders of 1991. But the goal is not exactly it's it's not the overall goal. The goal is to make sure that our children would not have to fight the same war and the same fight. And this is the main goal, the main principle. 
because what we have seen since the war started in 2014, uh, that it's impossible to have agreements with Russia. They are purely imperialistic and they will always want to destroy us. And so our goal is to make sure that uh, it's impossible for them to do that and that we have the protection and the new security system that will allow us not to turn into militaristic state, not to prepare our children to go through the same terrors that we are going through right now. It needs to end on our generation. So this is the goal, and this is why when we are asking for the weapons, we are looking for, forward towards this goal. So, um, Kyra, thank you for this. Uh, in Canada last year, uh, we passed a law, and I'm proud to have pay, played a role in passing, calling and passing this law, which allows for the confiscation and repurposing of the assets of sanctioned foreign individuals. And of course, there are many Russians that are on this list and there are Russian individuals and there are Russian entities on this list. Recently, Canada took the first step of implementing this law and we announced plans to seize $26 million from a company owned by sanctioned Russian oligarch Roman Abramovich. Now, my question, $26 million is in the large scheme of things, not a lot of money. You've talked about tanks, missiles, you've talked about victims, you've talked about infrastructure. But if Canada does this and other countries follow, what do you believe the money should be used for and how should it be managed? So I think this calls for a, a larger story about uh, to our listeners about how you and I met and um, as a general story about uh, confiscation as of assets of, of Russian Federation. So Alec, a little bit less than a year ago uh, in Davos, I met Bill Browder an author of Magnitsky List, who was um, who was talking to me about uh, using Russian money to rebuild Ukraine. And he was telling me that it would be a long and super painful process, and that if we really want to do it, we should start right away because it could take 10 years or more. He was basing this approximation on his, uh, his work with Magnitsky List. And so I said, OK, let's start working on it. Let's start gathering the international coalition and pushing for, for this idea of using uh, Russian frozen assets for the sake of Ukraine. As of right now, uh, it has been calculated uh, that about $500 billion of Russian assets are being frozen and stored in the countries all over the world. This 500 billion consists of Russian state assets, the central bank assets, money that Putin was putting away for a rainy day, and Russian oligarch money. And so, um, so different countries uh, were having different approaches to how do they want to handle both. So Canada has been um, a pioneer in going and voting for the legislation that will allow to use sanctioned oligarch money for the third third countries, which is us, <laughs> and which is fantastic. And I cannot even begin to tell you how grateful I am for it, for this happening, because it was basically the icebreaker. Every single time Bill and myself and anybody else were saying, were, were being told it is impossible to do that, we were saying, ha, huh, Canada have already passed the legislation. Ha, huh, we are waiting for first dollar or Canadian dollar to get to Ukraine. So as of right now, since, since the moment when it passed uh, the um, uh, Canadian Parliament, it's already United States who have followed the lead and passed the legislation right before the New Year's. And right now, a couple of days ago, similar, um, similar legislation was introduced in the United Kingdom, where we want to bite both oligarchs and the central bank assets. So it has been this... Uh, a great example on how the international policy works and we learn how it works and I can name you like five more examples. Ukraine candidacy to European Union. You have one or two uh, pioneers who push forward and then the rest follow. Getting Ukraine heavy weapons. 
same than acknowledging Russia as state sponsor of terrorism and now getting the tanks and getting the patriots in. The one should make a decision and then the rest will say, yes, okay, well, probably we should do it as well. And I know it's the hardest way, the hardest uh, path to be the first one, but it is so, so, so important about how the money should be used and about why the 26 million, 26 million, is it a lot or not? So it's a lot because it will again push countries uh, of European Union, push other allies that uh, may not be super interested in helping Ukraine, but may be super interested in, pu in, in punishing Russian oligarchs. So uh, there are a couple of ways that we are looking at how the money can be used. And it re really depends on how the, um, how the country looks at what they can do or not do. Of course, we would want money like wired directly to uh, one of the uh, governmental funds in Ukraine. Uh, however, we would accept like the ways that money can be cover covering some of the governmental programs inside the country that is supporting us. Like for example, in Canada, it could be covering the um, programs for Ukrainian refugees, the building schools for Ukrainian children, weapon programs that may be arising, training programs for Ukrainian military. Like there are many, um, many different ways of doing it. And honestly, whatever helps us winning, we will take everything. Uh, so uh, I, I know that there will be different approaches in different countries. I have recently talked to Kaya Kalas, uh, Estonian prime minister. She's looking at, at it like, uh, also something she wants to send to Ukraine, something she wants to cover for Estonian programs. Again, fine with us. I'm sure that it will all go to the, to the right place and all in all will help the main cause. But so, again, so I want to amplify the message about how important it is to be the first and like break the ice. Yeah, well, Canada, I, I think, is rightly proud to be the first. There is uh, huge support for the Ukrainians in Canada. We have the world's second largest diaspora of Ukrainians located in Canada. And everyone, frankly, at this point wants to be Ukrainian in Canada. So you have a huge amount of support. However, there is a little cloud on the horizon, and that is the latest reports on corruption in Ukraine, and there is concern about it. Uh, can you comment on that? Sure. So first of all, uh, this is one of uh, the reasons why I was saying that it may be easier or more useful to use the money by the government that confiscates it. So it will uh, remove this cloud and say, okay, you guys using it for our sakes, maybe you should buy something from yourself and just send it over. On the corruption, Ukraine is not perfect and is not ideal and has never been. And corruption has been always one of our main challenge. And this was one of the reasons that us new generations of politicians came in to, to fight it. And it would be naive to think that during the war, it just magically disappeared. The, um, uh, the point right now that we are taking is how do we react to it and how we are cleaning it, cleaning up the, uh, the, this hydra that, that is uh, there. And I think right now uh, the response on the reports that the president, his team received has been really rapid and uh, we hope that it will be effective. It's too early to say if it is effective. However, I want to look at it this way. We know that at some point there would be a huge investment into rebuilding of Ukraine. And um, uh, it will happen in parallel with the EU extension. And it is so critical for all of us, not only in Ukraine, but also for all our allies, that the processes of how the money will be distributed, of how they will be um, monitored, etc., that they will already be established uh, as the part of you, as a part of EU extension. We are all super interested in that because as a patriot, I don't want my country to Hello? Hello? 
Please go ahead. We, you are breaking up, but that's OK. We can we can still. Yes. So as a parliamentarian right now, what I can do, I'm pushing for us to uh, to get into EU as soon as possible. So uh, last year, EU Commission gave us the seven points that we needed to complete. And I can tell you on the parliamentary side, we passed all, all of it, like even before the new years. There is a still huge pass in front of us and it will not be a perfect pass. I know that. But I think the solution is not saying, oh, we will fight the corruption, is saying, we will put all the processes in place, same as they are in European Union. We will push ourselves as hard as possible into European Union so that uh, we will help fighting corruption this way. Uh, otherwise, I don't think we, we, we can. Like, I think this, this is the successful, this is the most successful path of all the others. Um, I know where we should we should move along here because of, of diesel generator issues and and those things. But I I, I just I, I remember reading the story uh, you know recently that you know uh, Ukraine has lost tragically lost uh, you know over 200 athletes uh, to this war. Uh, we've actually had uh, Ukrainian under 25 uh, hockey team come and tour Western Canada, played against uh, university teams here, um, and. And you know, at the very same time that this brutal war is going on, the International Olympic Committee is 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 uh, looking for ways for Russian athletes to participate in the Olympics. Uh, what do you think about this? I mean, I know sports may not be on the top of mind, but you know, the Olympics it's supposed to be a competition to bring people together, but uh, they are actually literally trying to figure out ways for a brutal invader to participate. This is a very important and ongoing issue right now in Ukrainian news because we are using all our powers and president is being very active in it, pushing against allowing Russian and Belarusian uh, athletes to participate. We have like at least 200 Ukrainian athletes who were not who who were killed during this invasion and and who will not be able to, to have the luxury of participating in any kind of team. And this is, again, one of the sides of, of the effect that it is having on my nation. So we, of course, we, of course, are in, we hurting when we hear it because it's just people are trying to find different ways and justifying and saying, oh, we will be, we will be outside of this. But there is nothing outside of the, uh, of the war, nothing that can be said, oh, the culture is uh, outside the politics. No, it is not. It is all a part of the huge, huge system that at some point led to the full-scale invasion and right now is a part of a full-scale invasion. So, um, you know, like when there were some people talking about the cultural side, that it's also uh, not related to politics and, and war, but it is 100% related. And we we see how uh, well uh, Putin and, uh, and Russia are using their narratives and uh, our mutual past to enforce the future on us. And this is something that we also will be fighting very hard not to allow to happen and make sure that our culture is maximally separated from, from like all the Russian narratives. I can, I can only tell you that every time we are facing some of this ignorance, it really, really, really hurts all the people who lost their loved ones, lost their family members. It will be not an over exaggeration to say that every Ukrainian family have either lost someone or have been to a funeral where you would know a person who who died, and and it just makes you makes your world so black and white that you that you cannot just return to to, to all those discussions. But another point that we always need to remember is Russia still spending an enormous amount of money everywhere in media, in external uh, foreign policies, in African countries, in Asian countries, uh, in democratic countries, in uh, world organizations to uh, switch the discussion to say it's not all black and white. It's like uh, there are two sides to the story, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And our goal is not to allow them to do that. And our yeah. goal is to keep telling the truth. 
So, Kyra, our last question uh, for the podcast, although we could continue to talk to you forever, uh, let's pivot to the future. Uh, what are your hopes for the future and what will peace look like for the Ukrainian people? So, uh, well, I uh, the hope is actually the main fuel that we are all running on here. And we do hope that we will, first of all, seize victory and uh, and, and will be able to uh, um, take part in rebuilding the country. I think this is something that we can that that is in everybody's mind. Uh, as I already said, was that main goal for us and the, for the way how the peace looks like is that we should not become a militaristic country. Because if Russia remains in their uh, in the way that they are right now, uh, we will have basically to become a, like a huge Israel where we will have always to be ready to to fight back. And this is not what I want for my country. I want my country to, to be um, rebuilt, to be cleaned up of the minefields, to be restored in, 19, in the, the borders of 1991, to have Crimea returned and make sure that we have this, uh, to uh, become a member of European Union and with the processes in places so we can, um, so we can build uh, not back, but we can build forward. You know, one of the my personal things every time I travel, especially to the countries like Poland and Baltic states, I'm looking around and I admire what they have done. But I also look at it with bittersweet because I say we could have had that. We we can have this, and I really want us to have this. You know, I work in a committee of digital transformation. My goal when I was coming to politics was to digitalize the country, to make sure that all your um, all your uh, interaction with the government is in your phone. And we were actually very successful in doing that because right now, basically most of your interactions are in your phone and the other countries are actually mimicking and buying the system of uh, person and government interaction from us. And this is something that we should, we, we can share with the world saying Ukraine is not only the country for uh, for donations. We are the country that actually can grow a lot and the world have already seen how we are agricultural country, resor resourceful country, technological country. Uh, we will have to work a lot on, on having people return back. We will have to work a lot on, on having people who never lived in Ukraine want to rebuild them, come back and help us doing that. But I see how we can how we can make it so much better and use this unique and probably very short opportunity of building the country that will, uh, you know, like heal the wounds and, 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 and be much better. You know, I come from a very poor family and, uh, um, and I went through all the revolutions and poverty and everything. And I wanted uh, so that we will build the country that our children would not know all of that they will be spoiled in a very good way and can pursue dreams that we will find too ambitious. We are right now robbed of it because our next generation of kids know the war and will have to heal from it as well. But I truly believe that it is all possible because over this last year, we have seen so many impossible things coming to life. So many things that nobody in the world believed at starting from the candidacy to European Union, to getting us the heavy weapons, to counter offense and taking back our territories and uniting so many countries in the world. And you know what? It's not important that nobody believes in you. The most important thing that we believed that it was possible for us. And we were able to achieve that. And right now we truly believe that we are capable of winning this war and building the best country that one can imagine. Thank you, Kyra. You are truly in your own person an embodiment of this fighting spirit of Ukraine that the world has come to admire so much. I say again, Canada stands with you and we wish Ukraine the peace that you have imagined. Uh, thank you to, to our listeners. And if you have any questions or responses, please uh, write to me via my Twitter account or my Senate email. We would, of course, love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Thank you and Slava. glory to Ukraine.